thank you for including uh, uh, me in your Congress. I'm Dr. Ronald Weinstein, and I'm talking to you from Tucson, Arizona. And uh, it's a great honor for me to be part of your uh, Congress again. Ironically, a couple of days ago, uh, we had a meeting in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, Dr. Dale Alverson and uh, Elizabeth Kaprinsky were the co-chairs of that uh, Congress. And so it's nice to be together with them as well, uh, to, albeit virtually. And uh, before I begin uh, going through the PowerPoint slides, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Francisco uh, La Rosa for including me in this conference. That's very thoughtful. And I certainly wish that I could be there in person. Okay, what I'm gonna do uh, over the next 25 or 30 minutes is give a broad overview of telemedicine dating back to 1968. So this is a 50 year summary. And for me, that's a celebration. And it's certainly a, a privilege in an academic career to actually get to see the uh, development of a field from its very inception. So I'm gonna talk about progress in telemedicine, uh, give a little bit of history, since I think, uh, I think people find that interesting, and then uh, do some updates on uh, how to build successful telemedicine programs. And of course, I'm dealing with both uh, telemedicine and uh, telepathology in the course of this presentation. Early, very early on in the telemedicine, tel early telemedicine was deeply rooted in the US space program. So NASA began developing space medicine in the, uh, 19, in the uh, 1950s, late 1950s. And uh, as this became a reality, they also had a, an interest in taking that technology and uh, putting it into terrestrial applications. And uh, one of the first terrestrial applications was in Boston, although, although I don't think they ever really publicly identified that program with NASA. Uh, but the players in, the, in NASA, as we can see uh, on, the, on the, the left of this logo, the red box, uh, the partner was Lockheed Martin Space Company on the right. And uh, they helped actually design the facility at the Massachusetts General Hospital and at the Logan International Airport that really became the first multi-specialty telemedicine program. Uh, there had been earlier telepsychiatry and teleradiology programs, which were standalones. So the first pro program at, the, at Harvard at the Massachusetts General Hospital was run by Dr. Kenneth Byrd, showing he, being shown here in 1968, right at the very beginning of their implementation of cases. And uh, I actually knew Dr. Bird with me being a resident in pathology at the time who had the very good fortune of being drawn into this program. Uh, so the original program involved uh, connecting the Massachusetts General Hospital on the left to the Logan International Airport and uh, this was a, a distance of about four miles and the connection was by microwave. Uh, it, the program was a walk-in clinic at gate 23 at the Logan Airport, which uh, became very famous. And patients who felt ill in transit through, the, through, uh, through air or, uh, or, or workers at the uh, airport, of which there were about 6,000, could utilize this facility even for their annual checkups. Uh, this was what was uh, thought to be a portable camera at that time, and you can see how the nurse was uh, outfitted at the time that uh, I would have been a resident there. And uh, this shows Dr. Bird uh, connecting to a patient out at the airport. Notice that he actually has earplugs, and he's, he's actually listening through an electronic stethoscope very much of, uh, as we would do it today, 50 years later. Okay, well, let's move to uh, Arizona four years later. And uh, with the success of that project, that, uh, which, which itself went on for uh, almost a decade, NASA decided that they wanted to show how telemedicine worked on a much larger scale and decided to do it on an Indian reservation that actually touches upon Tucson. So Tucson, and at that time a new medical school, uh, were very, very involved. And 
one reason for selecting it is that uh, the hospital in Tucson, which became our university medical center, the hospital was the first uh, hospital in the country to attempt to go paperless. So that's an interesting uh, historical point. Now, of course, the, one reason for doing it in Ar Arizona is that it's a very, very large state. Uh, Arizona is about the size of Germany, but uh, whereas Arizona has a population of almost 7 million, Germany has an, a, a population of 83 million. That's so a much denser population in Germany. So very large spaces were uh, problematic, and uh, that made Arizona an attractive place. And also our, our Indian reservations were very attractive since, since they're all on what's regarded as federal land. So this is uh, the northern part of Arizona where we do a lot of telemedicine. Uh, this sort of, this is a, a, a diagram of what the original configuration is. It involved the computer center, which was at uh, Tucson um, uh, uh, Medical Center uh, or uh, University Medical Center, a very large, the largest of the Indian Health Service hospitals. This is in Phoenix. It involved mobile clinics. It involved small rural clinics. It involved an extensive microwave telecommunication system. Here we can see they've chopped off at the top of the mountain to make it flat so that they could have, have this relay station up there. So this was very large, very elaborate, and very expensive. And uh, it cost about $6 million per year in 1972 dollars. I can't calculate that what that would be uh, now. Mike, what, what would that be now? Probably, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, our, our chief engineer says 100 million. I, I think that might be on the high side, but it was a lot of money one way or the other. So anyway, the, uh, uh, this was a very expensive deal. Uh, they did some, some very, very uh, sophisticated things. Here you can see NASA, Indian Health Service, and Lockheed. You can also see that the program only lasted for three years because the federal government decided not to continue it, and that was actually very, very disruptive to the tribes. So uh, this is the original uh, logo for, the, uh, for that project. Again, NASA and Lockheed Martin Space Company, Indian Health Service, and the Indian Reservation at that time was called the Papago Indian Tribe, and the project was called Starpac. And here we can see in one of the mobile vehicles, we can see a, a, a television camera and, and here a family, parents are discussing a pediatric case with one of the uh, local providers who was then hooking them in to uh, a pediatric cardiologist uh, at another location. And uh, this camera was very, very similar, if not identical, to one that had been used at uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital. Well, time flies. Uh, that was in 1972. This is in 20, uh, 2012 at, in Tucson at a meeting that we held at the uh, College of Medicine at which we honored the people from the original project. And this was 40 years later. This was the 40th anniversary. And we had the great pleasure. Unfortunately, all of the primary people were still alive. And uh, we could have a very, uh, very informative uh, celebratory anniversary celebration. And they had really done it all. They had done all of the things that had been done at the Mass General, but on a much larger scale. And here's the original uh, medical director for the uh, original project. He was in, in his uh, late 20s at the time that he had actually participated in Star Trek. Well, United States telemedicine. Uh, United States telemedicine, ironically, uh, as done in Arizona, actually came out of an international program uh, so in uh, 1992, I had relocated a couple of times and found myself as a head of pathology at the medical school in Tucson. And uh, this was in 1992, and we decided to do a, an international trial, clinical trial, uh, on patients using static image telepathology. And this was uh, the day we started it, June 1992. So it's almost, almost exactly uh, uh, 25 years ago. And uh, so this was the original group, and this was in Hermosillo, uh, Mexico, which is about uh, four hours to the uh, south of Tucson. Tucson's very close to the border. And for years, the pathologists down in Hermosillo brought their difficult cases up to the medical school for uh, second opinions, and uh, they were delighted to link in by video. So this really started our involvement uh, in the rebirth of telemedicine uh, in uh, Arizona. 
uh, and at the same time, the Department of Radiology was, uh, was uh, starting their program. So that was the basis, an original program, basis for us, a program that involved Mexico and also China, plus some sites in Arizona. Our state legislature decided to uh, fund an Arizona telemedicine program four years later, and uh, this is the logo. Uh, and since then, our engineers, including Mike Holcomb, have developed a very large network. So we have about 170, 160 sites in 70 communities around Arizona and uh, several uh, beyond the borders. Uh, we're very involved in, in training. We have many, many training sessions. We've had uh, uh, almost 2,000 individuals have gone through our training programs. So that functions as a state resource. Uh, and here is uh, Janet Major, who's uh, one of our one of our staff people demonstrating an otoscope. Uh, here, similar equipment is being demonstrated at the White House. So the current president and the head of uh, the National uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and the president is talking to, who is in Washington, D.C., uh, at the White House is talking to a patient, a teledermatology patient who's on the other coast, who's in Oregon. So this is what a modern setup for telemedicine would look like. Uh, we use video conferencing today routinely, just to, using the same service that's enabling me to talk to you. Uh, in this case, we're using a carrier it's called Zoom.us, and it's become commonplace. Many, many uh, specialties are done in, in uh, telemedicine today. A few of them are listed uh, on this poster. Uh, so looking through an otoscope at a ruptured membrane, Correctional telemedicine is, uh, is a big deal in some parts of the United States. Uh, here's a lesion on a lip. That's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, difficult to, uh, pretty difficult to uh, see, but it's, it's seen very nicely with the cameras that we use. Teledentistry is used particularly in our prisons. Uh, radiology has always been the number one application of telemedicine in general. Um, our institution uh, alone has done over 1.3 million cases into 25 hospitals. Uh, today, it's at 85% of hospitals in the United States, which is the total number would be about 5,500 uh, hospitals. About 85% of hospitals use teleradiology, at least for some of their activities. This slide went out. Oh, here we go. Teleophthalmology is a very good application. Uh, and then there are uh, more specialized applications. This is teleechocardiography that uh, one of our pediatricians are, is uh, talking to a neonatologist in a hospital about 300 miles away uh, in a neonatal intensive care unit. And that practice has been going on for years and involved hundreds and hundreds of cases. Uh, pediatrics is a very nice application. One rarely finds a pediatrician in our rural communities, so this becomes a, a really important linkage um, in many areas in the United States. Okay, so we've had quite an experience. We kind of started, you know, starting with international in our case and then moving to rural and now moving to uh, urban. And uh, I'd like to show a couple of slides dealing with what are success factors now. Uh, our program's been around a long time, but we've also gotten to know quite a few other programs. There's a national network of telehealth resource centers, and uh, I and Dr. Kaprinsky are very much a part of uh, that activity. So uh, we really get to see what goes on throughout the United States, and I think there are a couple of generalizations that uh, we could make at this time. First of all, of the 60 or 70 applications that uh, would be regarded as reasonably common in the telemedicine slash telehealth world, there, there are three areas that are particularly likely to succeed, uh, particularly as first applications within new programs. And the first of all would be gap services, uh, teleradiology, uh, telepathology, gap services for rural hospitals in particular and uh, those patients are frequently going to be patients who are in motor accidents. And uh, for example, the patient who needs a cervical CT scan 
and the issue is whether the patient has a has a broken neck and uh, needs to be airbagged a couple of hundred miles uh, to uh, to a large metropolitan area. So gap services, a gap in the sense that up before telemedicine, a radiologist would be a journeyman and uh, might come uh, to a hospital every three or four days or perhaps once a week or perhaps even once every two weeks in a very, very rural setting. And so the gap is the gap between when they come to that hospital. In the case of uh, pathology, the gap service would be uh, frozen sections of rural hospitals. And uh, there are many rural hospitals that really can stay open because they can get telepathology services that enable them to keep a surgeon at that hospital with that surgeon doing operations that really, really require, uh, or best of best of services would require having uh, somebody available to do frozen sections. And we could give many examples of, of uh, frozen sections being done by telepathology uh, really around the world. So gap services are important. Um, urgent services are uh, very, very important. And uh, in the United States, a quote unquote killer application, is a term we use for things that are very, very important applications, a little bit of slang of the English language. But the one that comes to mind particularly is telestroke. We now know that patients who are going to develop ischemic strokes as, as opposed to hemorrhagic strokes uh, can be uh, treated with clot busting drugs such as uh, TPA. And in order to do intravenous infusions of TPA to break clots, say in the car carotid arteries, in order to do that, you really have to initiate that within what's called the golden hour, although it actually refers to the first three hours. And, uh, uh, and beyond that, the drug becomes uh, progressively much less effective. And it's uh, been shown by vascular neurologists that uh, using TPA probably is effective in 90% of cases where the patients have what is classified as an ischemic stroke. And about seven eighths of strokes are ischemic strokes. So uh, that's, that's very exciting. And uh, that's really brought uh, that therapy mainstream in the United States. And there are even areas in the United States where treating with TPA is regarded as uh, a standard of care. Uh, so that's important. Teletrauma is an urgent service, much more difficult to do, uh, to organize and uh, make work. We've had uh, some, uh, some, I would say, limited excess successes, particularly at one hospital. And the part of the problem there is that even though it's very effective to set up a, a camera looking at uh, an emergency room, uh, and, and, the, and the person looking at that, uh, we would call a telepresence. They're viewing what's going on and helping the local physicians get through cases. Uh, they're very busy. Uh, typically, those are what we call level one trauma centers. And uh, those docs are <clears throat> just, just fantastically busy uh, all day and all night long. So to get them to break from what they're doing and actually do this takes, usually takes a trauma surgeon who has a personal inference, interest in doing that service. So even though teletrauma can be uh, very, very effective and can uh, certainly save lives in, in certain, uh, certain cases, it's not widely utilized. Now, a lot of people have, are working on putting uh, cameras, video cameras on uh, ambulances. Uh, we've certainly uh, done that experiment. Uh, but again, the value of doing it uh, remains to be seen. So far it's on the back burner, but telestroke is for real. And telestroke uh, I would regard as as a, a standard of care in many clinical settings. And then in the United States, we have mandated services. And uh, there's a requirement by the United States Supreme Court that prisoners, incarcerated uh, prisoners, uh, have a right to medical services. And, and uh, to, to deprive them of those services is regarded as what is called cruel and unusual punishment. So telemedicine, uh, there's an entire industry involving, in, involving uh, uh, private, as we call it, privatization of prison health care and uh, the use of uh, telemedicine. But the amount that it's used is very, very va variable from pr even prison to prison within a given state in the United States. So correctional telemedicine, also telepsychiatry can be a mandated service. 
uh, in the United States to do uh, a, an involuntary institutionalization of a patient with mental health issues, uh, typically a dangerous patient or a patient who's dangerous to themselves. In order to do that requires an opinion of two psychiatrists. And, you know, it's, it'd be unlikely to have one psychiatrist in one of our rural communities, let alone two. So uh, those, those opinions, first opinion and second opinion, can be done by telepsychiatry with uh, a high level of success. Now, in the United States, looking at that, you know, 50, 50 year or 25 or 10 year time frame, why do so many telehealth programs fail? And there is a high failure rate. For a long time, there was a program in California that funded about $6 million worth of new telemedicine programs uh, each year. And uh, for, for those programs five years later, you know, 90% or more of them would have disappeared. And uh, so very, very high failure rate early on in telemedicine. And what would be some of those root causes? And uh, we, can, we can base this part of the story based on our own experience, which, which now involves uh, hundreds of programs through the years. Well, one thing is demonstration programs, what are called demonstration projects, some seed money to start a program and demonstrate to a medical staff. Those, those things rarely work. Uh, they get funded. Uh, there's, you know, there's a champion. They look at some cases, but they don't have a sustainable business plan. Uh, they often don't really have uh, buy-in by a medical staff. Uh, they don't necessarily make it part of their routine. And uh, therefore, those projects uh, almost always fail, even, even though they're very popular. And, you know, people, particularly at, at academic medical centers, have a great urge to put their toe in the water. Uh, startup funds. When programs are started with just startup funds and then no continuation funding at the very beginning, they usually fail. Uh, unless telemedicine is uh, bought into by the leadership, by the chief executive officer, by the director of a hospital, with a recognized need for it as part of how that organization wants to improve its quality of its services or scope of its services or the size of its services if they have ideas to expand their medical center, uh, you know, that has to be built in from the very beginning. And as we see, the chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief information officer, we refer to that as the C-suite. If the buy-in is not in the C-suite, the program will likely fail over time. Uh, weak business plans, you know, if it doesn't make sense financially, it probably isn't going to work. Uh, even in environments that are uh, not really businesses, but are really public service types of entities. Uh, and uh, specialty disincentives. There are certain specialties, uh, medical specialties, in which the doc doctors are very unlikely to want to do telemedicine. Orthopedic surgery would be one example. Well, to make the diagnosis, but then not to have the patient come in to get surgery, that's a disincentive. Uh, even in the case of telestroke, giving that drug can be a disincentive because basically the telemedicine component is the diagnostic part to actually look at the CAT scans or the MRIs and also to do a remote physical diagnosis of the patient in order to say, yes, this person has the beginning of a stroke, but then not to actually give the TPA. That's a real problem because because the majority of the money from our uh, insurers or our federal insurers or state insurers actually is going to the site where the TPA is infused. So the people who are making the diagnosis aren't going to get uh, the lion's share of the, of, of the revenue, of the remuneration. And that's a disincentive. Uh, telemedicine and telepathology, they're not easy. They're harder than hands-on practice. Now that may change over time, and that may change over time because there may be modifications of what routine diagnostic algorithms are. We're seeing that particularly in Parkinson's disease. But there is a complexity. There's an intermediate layer. You have the telecommunications layer. Uh, often we require a case presenter other than the physician or the uh, practicing nurse where the patient is located. We need case uh, aggregators where the telemedicine 
cases are being read out. This, this is adding personnel. In other words, there are additional steps being added which add to the complexity. Collaborator uh, mismatches, the people who are making the diagnosis and the, uh, the, the people who are uh, sending the cases in and the, the specialists who might tend to the patient may be mismatches. They may be in different practices. They may even have different philosophies on how best to treat patients. So those kinds of mismatches are important. And then program champions, uh, people lead programs, uh, you know, guilty, I do that. But we do that with a special kind of uh, uh, energy, one might say, and a certain level of enthusiasm that may be above average. And it's very, very hard to uh, pass that on to a next generation in part because it's just there's a special thrill that comes with starting things and the next person doesn't get to do that it's like academic departments it's 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 actually difficult to turn the leadership over to a next chairman we do it but uh there's a certain uh there's something that's lost so program champions there are a lot of programs that have started and really look good and uh then uh you know somebody turns out and then there's a successor and uh it doesn't work the way it did so program champions are something to keep an eye on in terms of sustainability of programs okay okay the final thing i want to want to say about uh this part is uh, before i'm talking a little bit more about international programs is that there's an entire new wave of services in telemedicine which, which are actually going to dominate the marketplace. So the traditional kinds of telemedicine that we did will continue, but in terms of numbers of cases per year, it'll be swamped, it'll be flooded by a new kind of, a new, a new business plan. And this we refer to as on-demand services. And, and these are services where patients directly contact the uh, telephysician or the uh, telenurse and buy their services usually at a set dollar amount per session and often with a set amount of time the interaction may be five minutes 10 minutes often 15 minutes so we have a patient who's pulling up uh, a menu from a company uh, teledoc american well in the united states would be about 400 or 500 of those companies and they tap on the icon or the picture of the physician and the physician uh, and, and a form pops up on the screen where, where, which uh, the patient uh, checks off boxes as, as part of their history and, and then the physical takes place and uh, the, the provider pops up on the screen and generally these services will handle 15 to 21 common diseases, patients with earaches or strep throats, those sorts of things. And uh, they, the doctors can actually write prescriptions so that the patient can then go to a pharmacy and get the drugs. And so, uh, and in part, the patient is conducting the uh, self-exam. So, for example, they might put a special gadget on their smartphone and pop it into their ear and do uh, an otoscopic examination. Uh, can even participate in doing a one-lead or two-lead or 12-lead electrocardiogram. That can be done at a distance. And so these are on-demand companies. These companies are being uh, very effective in marketing their services. Uh, for the startup companies, they've been very effective in raising startup money. Uh, it's estimated, uh, one estimate two years ago was that $280 million was invested in a single year in these startup companies. And, and I put down at the bottom, it's agnostic telemedicine and telehealth. Agnostic in the sense that the identity of the doctor, I mean, they know the name, but they don't actually know anything about the doctor. The doctor's basically agnostic and they're quite interchangeable. So whoever is on duty may be assigned to that case. And uh, very, very agnostic. How big are these practices? They've gotten very large. There are companies in the United States that have three to 5,000 doctors on call and that three to 5,000 doctors may be doing all of that from an office in their homes, a virtual office in their homes. So that's, that's a relatively new phenomenon. Now that's taken telemedicine out to the general public, and of course they're very interested in participating. And what we're seeing is uh, uh, our num number one state laws that require reimbursement of these folks, these service providers. Uh, there are uh, new laws that are helping with interstate uh, medical licensure, which is always uh, a barrier to distant practice in the United States. 
Uh, there are laws that are, are requiring third party payers, insurance companies to pay for those services. And, and those types of laws are also spreading quite rapidly across the United States. Uh, over, over 30 state legislators have, have examined that. And I think within a year or two, either be a non issue because the insurance companies are just going to pay for it, or uh, it'll be because there are uh, laws in every state that make that happen. So that's a very uh, interesting phenomenon. Brand new, uh, facilitated by technology, uh, uh, and working well. And, and from my perspective as a physician, I would say, yep, it's very likely that uh, 85, 86% of patients can be handled very nicely by on-demand uh, telemedicine. So keep your eye on that. Uh, if it's not already existent in your country, it probably will be uh, sooner than later. Now, I'd like to say a few things, uh, since this is an international meeting, a few things about international telemedicine, both historical and uh, contemporary. Uh, our program uh, has done a lot of international telemedicine. Some of it's been through the Arizona Telemedicine Program. Some of it's been through our Department of Surgery. But projects have been done in many parts of the world. Uh, I think that uh, in our own case, we've done a lot of stuff uh, with Dr. Rifat Latifi in, uh, in, in, in the Balkans. We've done things in China. We've done things in India. Uh, the first of our programs in uh, Latin America was, uh, was in Panama. And uh, many of you have heard presentations on that before since members of your organization were central to those programs. So uh, just a couple of pictures as, as reminders. Uh, here we have uh, a circle at, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in Panama in a very mountainous region on India, one of the, several of the Indian reservations. Here are the planning of the program. You can see Dr. Vega with the blue necktie talking to the Minister of Health in uh, Panama City about the program. We think it's very, very important to start at the level of the president or the, or the uh, 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 Minister of Health in creating these programs rather than a bottoms up approach. Uh, an air view showing, showing uh, San Felix which was the, the, the uh, hub, uh, hub site and then several sites where we had uh, telemedicine clinics uh, way up in mountains. Uh, and uh, here we can see the uh, highway or the road that led to uh, those sites. And of course, this became pretty impassable during the, uh, particularly the rainy seasons. A typical remote site. Distance wasn't very great. Eight, kilometers, but the road was virtually impassable for at least part of the year. So a site that uh, one of uh, multiple sites that were implemented, a lot of this was funded through the U.S. Army at that time. Uh, the clinic had no doctor, no nurse on site. Uh, often it was a nurse's assistant who presented the case or uh, a medical intern often who had received their medical degree in uh, Cuba. So a real accessibility issues. Uh, the Army elected, so this program started around 2000. We used uh, video phones uh, because that's what the uh, U.S. Army was interested in trying out. And what we learned is that they worked uh, very, very well. Uh, presentation of some cases uh, from uh, Ciro uh, Inglesias, uh, which was one of the rural sites, to uh, the San Felix uh, Hospital which was regarded as the hub site and uh, listening to a patient's uh, breath sounds and uh, heart and so forth. Uh, a consulting site in San Felix, which was a 27 bed hospital. Something that's not mentioned here is that San Felix became a uh, part of the first PAC system that was implemented in Latin America. So a large, large radiology system grew out of this, this uh, US Army uh, implementation in partnership with the Ministry of Health in uh, Panama. Uh, this was the consulting room at uh, San Felix, and you can see the, the instructions on the wall, and we made it very, very easy for both the sending doctors, the referring doctors, and the uh, consultants to examine the cases, and the monitor is, is linked by a cable to the video phone, so we can see it very enlarged version of what's on the video screen on this large monitor. And that system will work very well. And uh, the program ran for a number of years. 
and uh, benefited uh, thousands of patients, thousands of patients from uh, from uh, uh, the Indian reservations, just, just like the early users were in uh, in the United States. This was a very high profile program. Here's Panama President uh, Martin Trejo coming and uh, and at San Felix and uh, talking to the uh, Dr. Rosamina, who was out at one of the rural sites in the lower lower uh, left hand picture, and uh, the president appearing uh, very uh, I don't know what he's thinking about, but he he sounds very what do you think, Michael? He sounds like he's very ecstatic. Maybe 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 his mother, like my mother, wanted him to be a doctor. Who knows? But anyway, he looks uh, he looks really happy. Day in the sun. And uh, what happened to that program? Well, in uh, 2009, uh, change, in, change in direction in the United States uh, when we had a new president, Barack Obama. And uh, what happened, to make the long story short, what happened is a, a number of our sites were picked up by the Lopez Family Foundation. And the Lopez Fa Family Foundation had actually started a program in Puerto Rico in 2010 and uh, then moved into the sites as we vacated them in Panama and began providing services. And uh, now the, what's called the, uh, the Lopez Family Foundation, uh, now has, has sites, I understand it, in a number of uh, different countries in Latin America. So telemedicine became their large focus. So our program was very involved during the first uh, eight or nine years of the Panamanian National Program. And then other groups came in and uh, partnered, and uh, I'm told that a number of those sites are still very successful. So that's my story. What I've summarized is kind of a 50-year uh, overview. I think what's interesting to me is telemedicine, as it's done today, is remarkably similar as to the way it was done originally. Uh, same services, same results. There was a, a major book on telemedicine published in 1975 that extensively described both Starpec clinical results and the mass general results. In other words, it's a technology that was born whole. A technology worked for the beginning, but the implementation took a long time. Uh, legal and regulatory and reimbursement issues and uh, selling it to uh, the medical professions and showing the value all are components that came into play in determining its ultimate success, as, uh, as just described to you by Elizabeth Kaprinsky and uh, Dale, um, that uh, as telemedicine moves center, center stage. So thank you very much for the honor of talking to your group. Have a good meeting.